Hey guys, Buildzoid here, and today we are going to be taking a look at the Maximus 12 Apex, uh, a motherboard that you've probably all been waiting for for a while. Um, and it's just like, and I've had it for for a while, and it's like, Buildzoid, why 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 hasn't the video come out sooner? And it's very simple. Basically, uh, I I wasn't like in the mood for shooting PCB breakdowns, and I didn't want to like make a video about a really exciting motherboard like this while being not excited. Um, for and it's not the fault of the motherboard. Like it was just like I didn't really feel excited about doing PCB breakdowns or really doing anything at the time. So. Um, yeah, but, uh, now I'm fine, so, hooray, Maximus 12 Apex, um, this thing is so, so cool, this is, uh, like, this is the best Apex ever, um, maybe Asus will make a better Apex in the future, but for now, this is the best Apex, um, and this thing is just so, so, so very cool, so, anyway, let, let's just get right into it, starting off with the, uh, rear I.O., uh, where you've got two PS2 ports. Um, this is for Windows XP support because this board is all about like proper extreme overclocking and you know like people who actually install Windows XP for benchmarks like Super Pi, which uh, and W Prime. Like there's basically a couple of competitive overclocking benchmarks which just run best on Windows XP. Uh, when the biggest problem with getting Windows XP up and running on modern platforms is uh, USB drivers and that kind of thing, and so the easiest workaround is to just have a set of PS2 ports. Bam! That, that Windows XP support, just like that. Um, then we've got plenty of USB ports, which I obviously approve of. 2.5 gig LAN from Intel, I believe, Wi-Fi 6 from Intel, and then we've also got the clear CMOS button and a BIOS flashback button. So basically everything a rear I.O. should have, as far as I'm concerned, is here got plenty of USB ports, you've got your Windows XP support, and you've got the, the BIOS flashing, uh, BIOS control stuff as well. So, yeah, I'm a huge, like, like this, this is a great rear I.O. Um, I mean, I'm still a huge fan of the board overall, but I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself with my thoughts here. Um, anyway, so let's take a look at the other features on the board. I guess I should address also the dual 8 pins. So for the 10900K, dual 8 pin power connectors actually is sensible, even if you're on like, uh, ambient, uh, cooling, because the 10900K just pulls, like, can pull more power than a 8 pin, like, you're, you'll still technically be within the spec, but you'll be really approaching the limit of what the spec supports. Um, and Asus is using like the solid pin power connectors, so each of these connectors can do at least 480 uh, watts. If you have 16 gauge cabling, they can do more. But uh, yeah, like uh, honestly, like it, at this point, like with a 10900K, also depending on how your power supply is uh, doing the, the CPU power cables, like it's just better to plug in both of these. Um, also, if you have a board like this, you should have a power supply with two 8 pin power connectors available. So. Anyway, but with a less than a 10900K, these these are optional. Anyway, um, other than that, we've got a postcode on the motherboard, which is, of course, extremely handy for troubleshooting any kind of boot issues, especially on Intel. This thing is extremely useful. Like, the AMD mother, like AMD postcodes tend to basically be, like, you screwed up, start over. Uh, Intel postcodes will actually, a lot of the time, tell you, like, oh, you... Like, uh, you can sometimes tell if you have your memory timings, like, super wrong, or if, like, the memory controller is not quite happy, or maybe you don't have quite enough memory voltage. Like, the the, the postcodes on Intel platforms are, are a little bit more informative, and so here it's far more useful. Uh, there's also color-coded troubleshooting LEDs, which are made completely redundant by the postcode, so, yeah, but they, they do exist. Um... And we have a power button, flex key button. So this functions normally as a reset button, but you can rebind it to have safe boot functionality and I think maybe a few other features. I think that it also has an option for like direct to BIOS. Um, anyway, for the most part on a board like this, I would just consider that a reset button. Then we have the LN2 mode jumper. So the LN2 mode jumper, normally what it does is it removes some extra voltage restrictions, like some voltage restrictions that the, the boards normally come with and uh, it'll preload some voltages for you to eliminate cold boot bugs and that kind of thing. Um, so that's what that does. Um, then under that, we have a bunch of switches, and I wonder if I have them in the correct order. Because there's an RSVD switch, which uh, basically preloads even more, like, cold boot bug removal, cold bug and cold boot bug removal voltages. 
Um, there's a slow mode switch, which just drops the CPU to the lowest possible multiplier. There's a pause switch, which uh, stalls out the CPU. It's actually pretty cool. The idea behind that is if you have a, uh, if you have an OC panel, um, you can basically pause, like if you're on a loading screen for a benchmark, you can pause the CPU. Um, and it is worth noting that it does actually put quite a lot of load on the CPU when it does that because of how it stalls the CPU out. Um, so you might crash, but basically you can stall out the CPU and potentially adjust some settings on the system while on a loading screen or something like that. But So that's the idea behind that. Um, so you get the pause switch, and then there's also... Is there a second RSVD? I think there's two RSVDs. Because we ha you have you have uh, there's RSVD, uh, slow mode, pause, and yeah. So there's there's got to be two reserved switches. So, um, and so the the yeah you can actually even see it on the board. So you have RSVD two, RSVD one, and I got the order wrong. So this one's pause, and then here we have slow mode. Um, and all of these switches are only active if you have the board in LN2 mode, otherwise they don't do anything. Um, then down here we have the retry button and the safe boot button. I'm really annoyed that these aren't color coded. Like, this one should be red as far, like, or one of them should be a different color from the other. Like, I've actually gone and sharpied the safe boot button on my board because it's super annoying to have to try read the inscriptions if you don't, because I switch boards a lot of the time. So it's just like, I don't necessarily remember which button on every single board does what. And it, it gets really annoying when it's like, I, I just want a safe boot. Why Why is the button the same color uh, as, uh, as the retry button? Anyway, so retry, what it does is it it's like a super version of reset. It brute forces the system to a power cycle. Um, and, uh, well, it's useful if you say crash the CPU so hard that the reset button stops working. Um, it, it can help you there. Like it's a bit more convenient for that kind of scenario, but the main purpose of it is actually, uh, retraining memory settings because Basically, during the post procedure, your CPU's memory controller has to figure out some operating parameters for the memory that uh, you, you won't necessarily have locked in all the time. And when it does that, sometimes it makes a mistake um, and gets stuck, or it makes a mistake and still manages to boot, and then you get into Windows and like your performance is really bad or your stability is really bad. So basically, uh, in, in those kinds of... Though, admittedly, if you get all the way into Windows, you can just sort of like restart. Well, no, you'd still have to retry, because the thing that, that retry does is it actually uh, resets the memory training parameters as, as a side effect of what it does. So... Um, yeah, like th this is basically like the primary purpose is for retrying memory settings, which is why it's called a retry button. Um, and then below that we have safe boot, which is by far my favorite button of any button ever put on a motherboard. Because what that button does is if you're like me and you're really lazy with saving BIOS profiles um, and you've just changed like all of the settings and for some reason it isn't posting because you made like one mistake, instead of having to start out like clearing CMOS and having to start over, you can just hit the safe boot button and you'll be right back in the BIOS with all your crappy settings and you can go fix them. So I love the safe boot button. It's super, super convenient uh, for memory overclock, really for any kind of overclocking. It's just awesome. I love the safe boot button. Definitely my favorite feature. Then we also have some voltage read points over here. And I do believe the vCore voltage read point on the motherboard is actually hooked to the... Uh, um, I wonder if we can see it on the back of the board. Uh, where is it? Oh, yeah, okay. Um, I think it's this chip over here. But basically... Um, so Asus boards have a op amp to replicate the die sense voltages that the voltage controller sees uh, over to the super IO. But what they also do is they replicate them over to the voltage read points over here. Um, at least I, on some boards, they definitely do that. I'm not sure if they do that on all boards, but on and I, and you do have the option to switch that functionality on and off in the BIOS. I'm going to go with that. That is enabled on the Apex 12. Um, because I'm not sure when they introduced it. Um, I know on the 11 series it was, and now I'm not sure if they like pulled it, like removed it or not, but yeah, anyway. So you get voltage read points and you can actually measure die sense off of these. Um, well, off of the vCore one, because the other ones don't really have like a die sense measurement. That's that's not a thing. Like the low power rails, you, you don't have to worry about that um, level of accuracy there. So 
Anyway, so you get your voltage read points, and they've managed to also not put them directly under the 24 pin, so, you know, because like, the thing is, if, you're, if your voltage read points are directly under the 24 pin, it's kind of annoying to probe them with the 24 pin plugged in, right? Um, and then you have your 24 pin, of course, and then we get over to these, like, funky laid out SATA ports, and, you know, when I first saw this, I thought this was completely stupid. But I now realize I was very mistaken because using the board just like sitting on my 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 table, you know, as a test bench, um, what this does is that if you have a SATA cable, it just naturally like it'll more it'll curve up above the board or, you know, like under the board much more easily than if it just sticks straight out the side of the board. Right. Because. Because I don't actually have the SSD, like, affixed to anything. It just kind of sits on my desk. And a lot of the time, if it was just dangling off that way, it would be dangling over the edge of my desk, which is kind of annoying. So, yeah, I, I actually... Like, this actually has benefits. I thought it was a complete... Like, when I first saw it, I was like, that's a completely stupid gimmick. That doesn't do anything. Um, but no, it, it actually makes, uh, you know, having your test bench SSD on your test bench slightly more convenient. Um, and it doesn't really harm anything about the board, so yeah, this this is cool. Um, I, I'm really surprised I'm saying that. <laughs> anyway, but yeah, so you get that funky SATA port layout, which actually is, like, kind of neat. Um, and then down at the bottom here, you get a BIOS switch for the dual BIOS functionality on this motherboard. Uh, the LEDs for indicating which BIOS is active are here. Um... Yeah, if you have a th triple slot GPU, like two triple slot GPUs, this is going to be kind of hard to see. Like, it's not a huge deal, but I, I really think they could have, like, I don't know, put the LEDs over here somewhere and not right next to the BIOS chips, but eh, whatever, not, not a huge deal. And then we also have a full speed mode switch down here, which... Uh, again, if you're using the motherboard for all, uh, in a test bench, this is super convenient because that just, like, I think, um, I'm pretty sure, like, I've, I've used it, and I can't remember exactly what it does, but as far as I'm aware, it just sets all the fan headers to, on the motherboard to full speed, um, which is, like, in a test bench scenario, that's super useful, because you don't care about noise, um, or at least I don't care about noise, and whatever fan I plug in, I want it going full speed. So, yeah, and the the thing is, like, the, the older Apex boards, the way they would handle that is they would just give you, like, a bunch of white fan headers, um, which would always be full speed, and you couldn't, like, switch between normal speed, like, PWM control and full speed. They were just always full speed. Um, but on this board, like, you do still have some of those full speed fan headers, but you don't have as many of them. And so... They also have the full speed mode so that even like the black ones will, will go to full speed. And hopefully I'm not wrong about that because I don't really feel like reshooting the video. But, you know, minor details. If I'm wrong about how that works, I don't actually really care that much. So anyway, that's sort of the, the you know, uh, basic features that you get around the board. Um, I'm not really a fan of the PCIe slot layout. And speaking of the PCIe, I guess it's worth noting that this motherboard does only use PCIe three gen, uh, PCIe switches for Gen three, not Gen four. So, um, and by that, like if we go on the back of the board, so these chips right here, these are PCIe three point oh. They're not four point oh. And so basically, what that means. Um, like, I'm not sure if that means, like, theoretically, this first slot could still support 4.0 speeds, maybe, if Asus didn't, like, like, maybe. Um, I'm not sure. Asus doesn't officially state that they support 4.0, but that slot could maybe support it, um, assuming that the signal integrity to it is good enough. Um, however, that last PCIe slot, like, there's no way, um, because that last PCIe slot goes through those 3.0 switches, and, well, those are 3.0 switches. You can't run them at 4.0 speeds. So that is, uh, this is kind of like, yeah, that's not great. Um, now, currently, it doesn't really mean anything because the Comet Lake CPUs do not support PCIe 4.0, but um, Rocket Lake will, or at least should. And so if you wanted to put a Rocket Lake CPU in this, you won't get PCIe 4.0 support on the last PCIe slot, maybe both. Um, also, this PCIe slot layout is weird, in my opinion. Like, I'm, I'm not really a fan of it. Um, so, yeah. Like, th this is a weird PCIe slot layout. Because basically it forces you, like... 
I guess in a daily build, you can do like two-way SL. Well, the thing is, I'm looking at, at it as like a general purpose overclocking motherboard, and it's like, I want to run three-way and four-way SLI or Crossfire. I don't actually have four of, do I? No, I don't have any four of any NVIDIA GPU. So, you know, like if I want to run a uh, four-way Crossfire, I can't because this motherboard doesn't have the PCIe slot spacing for that, um, which is uh, like, I'm a bit annoyed about that because the thing is I actually have because uh, I can run four way crossfire with like three GPUs because I have a, uh, you know, dual core, like dual core cards can crossfire with single core cards. Um, and you still can't do that on this board because this PCIe slot layout is just so weird because normally what you get uh, on most motherboards is your first is 16x, then you get like this slot would be 16x and then you get a chip and then you get your chipset slot all the way at the bottom. But yeah, here you just get the two two sixteen x slots, and then this one is like this is a more daily friendly uh, PCIe slot layout. But like, I, I like on one hand, Asus needs to sell these boards to normies, okay? <laughs> like otherwise, it doesn't make sense to make them at all. Um, on the other hand, is like I don't like this PCIe slot layout as an overclocker. I'm not a fan of this. Anyway, um, speaking of the PCIe slot layout and multi-GPU setups, you get this Molex power connector down here, which is for extra power to the PCIe slots, uh, which I think is honestly completely unnecessary on this board because it doesn't go above th two GPUs. And two GPUs aren't going to max out your, your 24 pin. Also, uh, you might notice that these two pins look a little bit different from all the other pins in that 24 pin. These are the 12 volt power pins. So those are the pins that have to like handle your PCIe slots and other high power consumption devices on the motherboard that aren't powered off of the eight pins, which the eight pins are generally just reserved for CPU power. And sometimes they'll also be doing like memory controller juice and that kind of thing. But most of the time, just CPU. Um, and like iGPU power, which we'll get to soon, um, is handled by the eight pins and then everything else has to go off of the 24 pins. So uh, they have the high current pins for the 12 volt pins and then everything else is just the standard current folded metal pins, which is just, just a little interesting detail about uh, the Asus 24 pin power connector. This does make it slightly less uh, like stiff to plug in because what I've noticed is the solid pin 24 pins are very, very stiff. And this like the, the folded ones are... Uh, easier to plug in and unplug just because the like actual pins are squishier because they're not solid um, so yeah anyway but the thing is with just two GPUs you're not going to overload these two pins over here so this this down here is kind of unnecessary as far as I'm concerned um, but yeah so that actually covers sort of all of the non-VRM things that are worth covering in my opinion and let's talk about the VRM um, so this thing, uh, is, like, the thing is, Asus does, like, copy-pasting their VRM around, so I believe they have it also on the Formula. Um, yeah, Formula has the same VRM, and I want to say, and the Extreme has the same VRM with slightly different power stages, but anyway, this, all of this is just V-Core, um, and it's also an 8, uh, and it's an 8-phase, um, which, uh, like, yeah, it's an 8-phase, um, controlled by this chip right over here. I'm, I'm not sure what I wanted to do with that. Um, oh, I remember. Whatever, doesn't matter. So, yeah, you have an 8-phase V-Core VRM controlled by this chip right over here, and that chip is, where do I have it? It's, uh, oh, right, of course, it's an Asus high-end motherboard, so it's using an ASP1405, also known as, like, the, basically, that's a rebrand of the International Rectifier 35201, um, which is a, which for a long time was basically the best voltage controller you could get from International Rectifier. It goes up to eight phases, doesn't go past eight phases, um, and, uh, yeah, so that's what that is. Um, and so basically, like, because this is just an eight phase, um, there's no like doublers or anything going on with this VRM. And what Asus is doing um, with all of the power stages, because this does look a hell of a lot like a 16 phase, but uh, we've seen this on other Asus motherboards before. Uh, what they're doing is they take one PWM output from the controller and they just jam it into two power stages at the same time. Now, uh, the reason why you would normally put a doubler between your two power stages and your controller instead of doing this is that you could theoretically get slightly better if it, like, in theory, you should be getting slightly worse efficiency by doing this because you can't control the current through each phase, like, through each of the power stages 
very, very accurately. In practice, um, the whichever, like the power stages don't actually go that out of balance, so it doesn't really affect the efficiency very much at all. Um, and so it really doesn't matter. And that's why Asus doesn't bother with the, with the doublers. Now, the other advantage that the doublers introduce is that if you have a really low phase count, you can reduce your switching noise. Um, but eight phases is not a really low phase count. That's like for a very long time, you re couldn't really go over eight phases with some exceptions. Um, and there's diminishing returns as you keep increasing phase count. So like going from eight phases to 16 phases is not as much of a switching noise improvement as going from like four to eight. Um, and the other thing is you can also just solve any switching, like switching noise problems by adding more input filtering capacitors and Asus really likes input filtering capacitors. So we've got three up here and then another five along this side. So basically you have one bulk input capacitor per phase and then i think on the back and then yeah on, on the back you have your you know two multi-layer ceramics per power stage which that's normal you see that on basically all boards but yeah um so basically all of the like input switching noise concerns you can solve that with just more capacitors the efficiency thing well that's not really that much of a thing most of the time so it's not really a concern um anyway um, like the bi the biggest downside to not having independent control over each power stage is that you might like you you can't uh, super granularly dis turn off bits of the VRM. Um, you're kind of stuck with all of the phases running all the time. Like well, you're you can't like you can't phase shed with as much granularity as you could if you had doublers or a higher phase count controller. But again, that like only affects idle power consumption, and at idle your efficiency is gonna like. Like at idle, your VRM heat output is so low anyway that it really doesn't matter on a desktop platform. So yeah, um, so yeah, so we've got this beast of an eight phase, and and that's the control scheme and the logic behind why Asus doesn't bother with doublers. And also, you get less delay. Like the the other thing is the one downside to having doublers is there's a little bit of propagation delay for PWM signals going through doublers, and so your transient response can be slightly worse. Um, and I say can be slightly worse because there's lots of motherboards out there with doublers and also absolutely amazing transient response. There's also a lot of motherboards with no doublers and and terrible transient response and then motherboards with doublers and te tra terrible transient response. So basically, uh, if you actually want to know how the transient response of this board is, you'd have to ask an oscilloscope. Um, but yeah, that, that that's like the the decisions behind why Asus doesn't use the doublers. Anyway, um, so that's that's about the control scheme. We've just got a eight phase with uh, two power stages in each phase, and as well as two inductors in each phase. And you have to have the two inductors. You can't have two power stages outputting power into one switch node because they'll like each power stage has its own control circuitry. They'll get very upset about that. Um, anyway. Um, let's talk about the actual power stages. So all of the power stages in this VRM um, oh, and I guess I should have mentioned that there's no iGPU VRM on this motherboard whatsoever. So if you intend to use the integrated graphics on your K-series CPU, you can't. This motherboard literally can't power it. Um, so if you buy a 10900K, you want to use the iGPU for QuickSync or something like that, you can't. The, there's no way the board is able to power up the iGPU. Um, I don't really see a problem with that. It's an extreme overclocking board. We nobody cares about the iGPU in that that like in that area. And even most, I, I think even most daily system builders probably don't care about the iGPU that much. So, yeah, I, I don't really see it as a loss. And there are benefits like well, you can dedicate more of the VRM to V core without having to spend a lot of money on like a second controller and just yeah. So m much simpler is to just not have an iGPU at all. Um, Anyway, um, where was I going with this? Yeah, power stages, what are they? So these are all TDA2, uh, 1, 4, uh, 7, 2 power, uh, smart power stages from uh, Infineon, also known as International Rectifier because Infineon owns International Rectifier. Um, and these are 70 amp smart power stages. And now a lot of people might be like, but wait a minute, aren't these like weaker than some of the 90 amp smart power stages we see on like even some of the lower priced like boards that are even cheaper than this board? Because this board is around $400, assuming that it isn't completely sold out and not going to be in production again. Like the, the sad thing about the Apex series is I think for like the Apex 11, 
they only produced, I think, like from what I've heard, there was only 5,000 of them ever made. And so it's like, yeah, if you didn't get one of the initial 5,000, you're not getting one because they're gone unless you can find one second hand. Um, and I like, hopefully they make more of the 12s. Like, I, I really hope they make more of the 12s because these are such cool boards and it's just like there, there should be more of these. Um, anyway, so you might be like, oh, um, why like uh, 70 amp smart power stages isn't this worse than like similarly priced boards or even some of the cheaper boards which use 90 amp smart power stage as well? No, because basically once we get up to like the 60 amp and the 70 amp and the 80 amp and the 90 amp power stages, uh, around the current outputs that we actually care about with a uh, mainstream motherboard like this, uh, or mainstream CPU motherboard like this, the efficiency is basically the same. So it doesn't matter that this is on the 70s and there's some other boards on 90s, it doesn't make a difference. So this is, and also this is like super, super overkill because we do have 16 70 amp smart power stages here. So the power handling capacity of this thing is absolutely stupid. Um, what that means for the VRM efficiency is that uh, outputting 1.2 volts while running at a 400 kilohertz switching frequency, um, this VRM will produce, uh, will be able to output 200 amps while producing only 16 watts of heat, um, or around 16 watts of heat. Um, and then 300 amps output, it will be only producing about 24 watts of heat, which basically what this means is that if you're running a 10900K, like maxed out 10900K overclock, um, you can literally um, run this VRM without a heatsink. Um, assuming that you're not in a super hot room. If your room was like 30 or 40 degrees ambient temperature, then you might, you, you should probably keep the heat sinks. But if your room's like 25 to, to, well, even actually even at 30 degrees, the VRM should be staying just like around 100 degrees, which isn't really a problem. So yeah, like the, this VRM is just like, it literally, like it's so literally so good that for normal overclocking, you don't need the VRM heat sinks. Um, 300 amps output, you're going to be looking at about 24 watts of heat output. 400 amps output, um, it's going to be producing about 32 watts of heat output. Then 500 amps output, it's going to be producing about 45. So uh, basically around here, we start needing the heat sinks because we're looking at like 2 watts per power stage. And at that point, the, the power stage, like at that point, the PCB and the power stages themselves are no longer able to dissipate the heat without uh, extra surface area. Um, and, but yeah, like that's like 400, like you're not going to hit 400 amps on water cooling. Like you'd need to be on liquid nitrogen to get into these kinds of current draw ranges. And at that point also, like normally if you're doing LN2 overclocking, none of the benchmarks run that long. So the VRM doesn't get that hot. And also the board is probably freezing through. So yeah, like the, the, you, you could run LN2, like you could do LN2 benchmarks without VRM heat sinks on this just fine as well. So yeah, that's kind of neat. Um, 600 amps output, this VRM will be producing about 64 watts of heat. Um, and like we could go past that, but it's just like there's no real point. Like even 600 amps, I, I'm i not sure if that's possible to... I don't... Yeah, I don't think you get even... Six, like, like, well, there might be some benchmarks that peak around 600 amps current draw uh, when on LN2 and like the CPU is completely maxed out. But yeah, like... Th this VRM is just super, super overkill, um, which is what you'd expect for a motherboard like this. And uh, yeah, power-wise, this this thing is absolutely amazing. Um, oh, one thing I didn't mention is actually the whole putting your power stages in parallel like Asus does. Um, there's a kind of neat benefit because you need to use... Um, well, you don't need to use, but um, Basically, by putting your power stages and your inductors in parallel, um, you get an effective per phase output inductance is lower. So Asus likes to use 400 nanohenry inductors. Um, and the reason why this is significant is that the lower your per phase inductance is, the higher, like the, in theory, this, the better your transient response can be. And I say again in theory, because I've seen some other boards with like 150 nanohenry inductors and completely crap transient response. So it's just kind of like, there's a lot of things that you can use to try and improve the transient response but seeing any one of them doesn't mean that the transient response is good. Um, but anyway, uh, Asus likes to use 400 nanohenry inductors, which the, the cool thing about this is, is that um, 
Uh, so each power stage has a 400 nano Henry inductor, and if you put them together in parallel, you get 200 nano Henry's effective like phase inductance. Um, and the uh, cool thing about this is, is that actually the higher your like in like the higher the inductance uh, after the power stage is, the more efficient your power stage is. Slightly, again, it's very very slight improvements in efficiency, but improvements nonetheless because the rate at which the current ramps through the induct uh, through the power stage is slower so your uh, rms current through the power stage is lower and therefore the heat dissipation is slightly lower um so yeah that's just kind of like fun fact um th this actually has potential efficiency benefits now the thing is uh, if I remember correctly, the efficiency graphs for most power stages, when it comes to like uh, like inductance versus uh, efficiency, so you'll have like we'll have efficiency there and like inductance down here, which eh, we're not going to use the actual scientific like the scientific labels. So um, normally that looks something like this, and this point will usually be around 200 nano Henry. So these are really like not probably doing much of anything. Um, also, the, the scale here is just way off. Like, you might have, like, 1 to 0.9 right here. So it's not 0.95. So you can, like, improve the efficiency of your uh, phases by, like, a couple percentage points by using slightly higher inductance inductors. But, yeah, it, it's... Uh, ba basically, what that means is, like, if you used, like, a 100 nanohenry inductor in each phase instead of a 200 nanohenry inductor in each phase, you're... Uh, instead of producing 16 watts of heat, the VRM would produce 17. So it's really not a big deal, but it's kind of like, yeah, there's, this is kind of neat that you can basically have the much higher inductance relative to the, like, for each power stage, but then your phase inductance is actually low because it, it ends up being in parallel when, like, because the power stages switch on and off at the same time. So the inductors end up in parallel every time the high side switches on. Um, and then otherwise the inductors are always in parallel when the low side's running, so... Yeah. Anyway, so that's kind of just neat side, like side effect, like neat benefits of the way Asus uh, builds their VRM. Um, anyway, um, so yeah, that's kind of the power handling and control aspect of the uh, B Core VRM on this board. And so control scheme, I really see no issue with this. Um, honestly, like it, even if it was less than eight phases, I wouldn't have a problem with it. But yeah, it's an eight phase, like. There's really nothing to complain about here, and I'm aware that like in Asus could have gone for like the XDPE 132G5C voltage controller from Infineon, which goes all the way up to 16 phases. But the thing is, I've seen oscilloscope measurements of the performance of a VRM with the XDPE 132G5C compared to uh, an Asus uh, eight phase like this, and there's not really any difference. So. Uh, yeah, like, I, I'm not going to complain about this. This is a really, really good 8 phase. Um, it can keep up with a really good at 16 phase. Like, there's kind of a hard limit to how good a VRM can get. Um, well, there's not really, like, there's not a hard limit, but there's there's significant diminishing returns. So, you, you just end up kind of not getting many benefits past a certain point. Anyway, um, let's take a look at the back of the board. Because, uh, so we've talked about the control scheme, um, so there are, now let's talk about some sort of neat things like capacitors, power planes. So one of the benefits by not having an iGPU uh, VRM on your motherboard is that your power plane, because the thing is, uh, if I remember correctly, on the socket, um, vCore comes in, actually you can really see it clearly here, so vCore comes in through like this area. Um, and this is where all of your vCore power comes into the CPU normally. And then the iGPU power comes up, uh, comes into the CPU in sort of this area. And so if you have an iGPU, um, what that basically means is you're going to have like an iGPU power plane that goes something like this. And, you know, like, yeah, so you're going to have something like that. And the thing is, by getting rid of the iGPU VRM, well, you, you don't need to have all of that over there. So you can just have vCore coming into the socket just everywhere. Um, so that's one of the and in theory, like and in theory, that should reduce the uh, inductance of the power plane and the resistance of the power plane, which should translate into slightly better transient response. Um, so slightly better voltage regulation. Um, 
So yeah, and so that, that's a cool benefit of not having uh, an iGPU VRM is just like you can build a power plane that basically looks, uh, for this board, I'm gonna guess it looks something like this. Um, it's gonna go down here and then gonna go like that. And actually this might, no, that should be system agent down there. So you're gonna have a power plane that looks something like that, which if you had an iGPU, um, it would look more like this. Right, you'd have something more like that with this part being all iGPU. Well, now you can have this. So current can go more directly into, well, the, the CPU portion right here because the CPU pins are right there sort of. Um, anyway, so that's kind of a neat side effect of not having the, the iGPU VRM should lead to slightly better transient response. Uh, and the other thing that is like, that I'm a big fan of with, with this board that Asus has done is uh, so your bulk capacitors are the usual, just Nichicon FP series, 10,000 hours rated capacitors. These are all aluminum polymers, through holes, not, not really that special. Um, there is a lot of them, but yeah, they're not really that special. We do have these little uh, extra multi-layer ceramics around the socket, which uh, should help with transient response. But what I'm a really big fan of that Asus has done with the, like they're doing it on most of the Maximus 12 series boards, um, is they've added these tantalum polymer capacitors directly into the socket. So I'm a big fan of those because uh, you can get a lot of capacitance with a really low ESR, really low ESL, basically wherever you need it because those are absolutely tiny. Like these can be 220 microfarads each. Okay, like <laughs> they, they can have a lot of capacitance uh, depending on how much Asus is willing to spend on them. Uh, the two, like, because I've actually lo looked into buying some of the 220s in this, uh, this package, and uh, they're like $2 a piece. Admittedly, I'm not buying, like, thousands of them, but, yeah, they're, they're expensive. Um, and I'm going through a third party, like, DigiKey, which makes them more expensive and that kind of thing, but anyway, and then we have two more of those on the back of the socket, so, you know, that's kind of neat, like, Asus is adding extra capacitance to further and try further improve the transient response and then the other thing um that i'm a big fan of is they have absolutely flooded the rest of the socket with multi-layer ceramics and you'll notice that there's a bit of a color difference between like these and the rest of this socket and uh i suspect that these two right here so these should be for memory power and i expect those two capacitors to be 10 microfarads but i'm pretty sure all of the other ones which are this more like yellow color those should be 47 microfarad uh, 0805 capacitors. You literally can't get a higher capacitance uh, 0805 multi-layer ceramic. Um, so I'm also a big fan of that because uh, like basically they've really jammed a ton of capacitance into the socket to try and improve the transient response. And for comparison, here's what the uh, capacitor configuration of the Maximus uh, 11 gene looks like. So. Yeah, um, smaller capacitors, less capacitors, um, no tantalums anywhere, right? And, and then Apex. And actually, this is the they had the same configuration on the Maximus 11 Apex. So that it's more like Maximus 12, Maximus 11, Maximus 12, Maximus 11. So yeah, I, I have very high expectations for when I finally hook up the oscilloscope to this board because uh yeah like asus has gone to town on that cpu socket uh, i very much approve of what they've done here so yeah that's really cool and so now i think we can move on to the other things around this board that aren't the vcore vrm so down here we have the various minor voltage regulators um asus has a really large vccsa rail for some reason um which is pretty we like yeah they have a really massive vccsa rail um, it's controlled by this chip over here, which is another ASP1405, at which point, honestly, they could have had an iGPU phase. Like, because the biggest, like, well, not on this board, but there's other boards where they do this as well, where you have an ASP1405 for VCCSA, but then they don't have an iGPU phase. And those are more like daily boards, like, say, the Formula. Um, this is an Apex. No iGPU. I want my bigger power plane. Thank you very much. But, uh, yeah, on the other boards, I think it would have made sense to to use this controller down here for an igpu phase because it's like like this thing is another asp 1405 like it's an eight phase controller there and as far as i like uh and uh you know th they're using two of them just for the vccsa rail so this is running as like a two plus zero which is like if you need an, I an igpu phase you could just run it as a two plus two or something 
you know, so, yeah, anyway, yeah, VCC ASA is super overkill on this board, I'm pretty sure this is the most substantial VCC SA VRM on Z490, um, as Asus has these two power stages for it right here, and those are NCP, and they're not very strong power stages, these are NCP, uh, 30, 20, uh, 45s, which are 45 amp DR MOS components, so, you know, you need, like, external temperature sensors and everything, they're not very, like, oh, I forgot to talk about what smart power stages are, why, well, why smart power stages are smart power stages, and we can talk about that right now. So smart power stages are smart power stages because they integrate very accurate current monitoring, though it doesn't, it's it's only really accurate at high current outputs. It's very bad at idle. Uh, at idle, it's horrid. Um, but at full load, it's very accurate. Or at least, well, full load. At higher loads, it's it gets less and less accurate the less current is going through the power stage. So that's kind of the issue. Um, and I can't remember, like, where exactly the transition is for the accuracy actually getting really good. Um, but they can be very, like, they are very accurate, at least one, once you have, like, a 10900K at full load, they are accurate. I know that for sure, <laughs> but at idle, they're terrible. Um, and then, uh, what else? Uh, right, they have built-in temperature monitoring, built-in over-temperature protection, built-in overcurrent protection, built-in short-circuit protection, like, a whole bunch of safety features built directly into the power stages, and that makes them smart. Um, the DR MOS components, on the other hand, just don't have any kind of safety features, and, uh, I do believe these have a thermal flag system. Yeah, these have a thermal flag system, but, which basically means they can tell the voltage controller, hey, I'm overheating, but they can't, like, they don't do any current monitoring or anything like that, so that has to be, uh, handled with some extra external circuitry, um, as well as, like, if you actually want a temperature readout from the VRM, you have to have thermistors for that, so, yeah, um, now that doesn't really matter because this is VCCSA, and VCCSA is not a high current rail, so who ca like I don't care. Um, and this is really overkill for VCCSA. So yeah, 45 amp DR MOS for that. Um, then we've got the other minor rails. I'm not sure which one's which, but you're gonna have like VCCIO, and my notes don't cover the other rails that are down here. So yeah, but there's there's a bunch of minor rails for for over like the main one would be VCCIO, and then there's, like, other ones that I've forgotten the name of, um, and they're all down here, so, yeah, that's what all these different minor regulators down here are, as well as, like, these linear ones over here. Anyway, um, now let's take a look at the memory section of this board. So, for the memory, um, we've only got two DIMM slots, because this is a very serious extreme overclocking motherboard, and, uh, having four DIMM slots makes your memory overclocking worse because you've got longer memory traces and you've also got the interference created by the extra DIMM slots being present because the uh, unpopulated DIMM slots, the pins from them, cause a whole bunch of like uh, reflection issues and I do believe they also pick up, like, call, do cause some issues with like picking up EMI from the environment. So, yeah, uh, unpopulated DIMM slots are bad for overclocking, and also just the fact that they make your memory traces longer is bad for memory overclocking. So for a for the Apex boards, what Asus has been doing um, is they only have one DIMM per e for each memory channel because that is the best for memory overclocking performance. Um, now in the past, the downside to this was that Asus didn't really have that great support for dual rank memory sticks. So if you wanted to like actually, you know, take advantage of the great memory overclocking supports of various Apex boards, you couldn't run 16 gig DIMMs on them because they would just get stuck at like 4,000, like somewhere between like 3733 and 4,000 megahertz, you'd just get stuck and couldn't go above that. Um, but with the latest Apex, they've actually fixed the support for dual rank DIMMs. Also, you can get uh, single rank uh, 16 gig DIMMs these days. So it's much less of a problem. Like if you were actually building like a daily system and you want to run 32 gigs of memory, much less of a problem than in the past where if you had an Apex, you were stuck running 16 gigs or stuck running under 4000 megahertz. Um, you didn't really have an option in uh, any other options back back then. So um, yeah, but... Uh, Anyway, so we've got the two DIMM slots for the better memory overclocking, and now we have also the stronger uh, support for the dual rank memory sticks. For the memory power, we've got this two phase over here, controlled by an ASP1103, um, which is a rebrand of I don't know what right now, but yeah, ASP1103, um, and that's a two phase controller. 
And Asus has been copy pasting this memory VRM around for ages and ages and ages. Also, this extra DIMM slot is just for M.2 SSDs. It's just like a fan, like an alternative connector for like a daughter board with that that takes M.2 SSDs. Um, I think it's kind of silly, but it does mean that instead of having like M.2 SSD slots down here like that, you, you just have your M.2 SSDs over here. Um, and it should help with cool. And, and the, I think the idea behind that is it like it helps with cooling the M.2 SSDs. But um, I don't use M.2 devices, so I don't really care. Um, Anyway, what's neat about the memory power delivery is we have so many SMD aluminum polymers. Like, damn. Oh, and multi-layer ceramics for days. So, yeah, and I think they only have them on the front. Oops. Pretty sure they only, yeah, they only have them on the front, but that's fine. Um, because, honestly, like, there is just so damn many of them as is. Like, <laughs> so... Yeah, um, so the memory out, like the memory power output filtering is just absolutely ridiculous on this board. Um, I'm pretty sure, like, yeah, I'm pretty sure this is probably the, like, both the largest number of capacitors and the best type of capacitors that you can get for memory output filter, like, that you'd get in the memory output filter of any uh, Z490 motherboard. So, yeah, that's really cool. Um, and then what else was there? That's kind of it. Oh, I forgot to mention. So um, the board uses a six layer PCB, um, which does sound kind of low. But the thing is, if you do only have the two DIMM slots, um, you don't need that many layers because you've massively reduced the complexity of the memory layout. And so that's basically why, like, because the thing is, you do have some two DIMM motherboards out there, which are like eight layers or even 10 layers. But... Um, the Apex series and even the Maximus 11 gene, like, these boards have never had more than six layers. And Asus has, like, and if you just look at the overclocking achievements of these boards when it comes to memory, um, it does, it sure doesn't look like Asus needs any more layers. So, um, yeah, that's, that's kind of that. Like, I don't know for sure that they couldn't maybe benefit if they added, you know, an extra two layers, but it's probably very similar to the situation that you have with the vCore VRM where it's just like, like, yeah, we could go to 16 phases. It wouldn't really do anything for performance. Um, so similarly, I expect that, like, I assume there the reason why this board has, like, the Apex series has never bothered to go above six uh, six layers is just, like, it's an ATX board, because um, the thing is, if you have, like, an ITX board, then it makes sense, like, you need a higher layer count, like an 8-layer PCB or a even a 10-layer PCB in some cases, just to accommodate, like, standard motherboard functionality that you'd need to have on a, on a motherboard, right? Um, but this is ATX. There is tons and tons of room to just go around the dim, like, go around uh, sort of the memory keepout zone, right? Which would be basically er all the space between the memory slots and the CPU socket. Um, like the only things that are there are going to be memory power and memory traces. And on an ATX board, this is very easy to do because there's just so much space. So you don't need a bunch of extra layers to accommodate, like, like there's, uh, ITX boards where you have like voltage regulators sitting between the CPU and the memory, uh, memory slots, or you have SATA ports jammed in between the CPU, like jammed into like this area which on an ATX board, like, you don't need to do that kind of thing, so you don't need the extra layers to accommodate the uh, extra layer, like, to accommodate that complexity, or more like accommodate that density. So, yeah, um, and that is the Maximus 12 Apex. So, you know, we've got a monster of an 8-phase V-Core VRM. Asus has totally, like upgraded the capacitor configuration of the CPU socket to like way beyond anything we've had on, on any past Asus motherboards. Um, the memory output filter, this isn't new. This insane memory output filter isn't new. They've had that before, but it's still here and that's a great thing. I also don't think it makes that much of a difference to the memory overclocking. Just like from my, like the thing is DDR4 just isn't that hard to power, but I'm still a big fan of the fact that we've got so much, like, so many SMD aluminum polymers for the memory power. I'm, I'm, I'm still a big fan of that, even if I don't really think it practically does anything. But, like, I'm, I'm, I'm a fan of the 16-phase voltage controllers as well. So, you know, it's just like, 
Like, sometimes I like ridiculous stuff just for being ridiculous, even if it doesn't necessarily make too much of a difference or any difference. Um, you could probably, like, remove most of these capacitors and it would still overclock memory just fine. Um, so, yeah. But, anyway, so, Monster 8 phase, um, new, so new capacitor configuration in the sockets, you've got all of the overclocking features you could ever want. Um, the BIOS is better behaved than ever before in my experience. Like I have a Maximus 12 Apex. I've been messing with it. Uh, the memory support has been way, way more reliable than like my Maximus 11 gene was. Um, so yeah, like just so, so like th th this is definitely like I I'm such like th this is probably one of my favorite Z490 boards. Like I absolutely love my Apex. I'm so glad I picked like I bought one. Because um, Asus doesn't send me review samples because I keep offending them when I cover other motherboards. But yeah, every so often, like, but but every so often they make something like the Apex, and well, it's an amazing, amazing motherboard. So yeah, um, that is it for the video. So uh, thank you for watching. Like, share, subscribe. Leave any comments, questions, suggestions down in the comment section below. If you'd like to support what I do here with uh, actually hardcore overclocking, I have a Patreon. There's a link to that down in the description. Um, if, uh, what else is there? Oh, alternatively, um, there's also the AHOC Teespring store where you can pick up shirts, stickers, posters, you know, the usual YouTuber merch, um, which also supports the, the channel, allows me to do things like say, buy Maximus, uh, buy, buy this motherboard um, because Asus, Asus won't send me one, um, which like, it's fine. Like, I, I don't mind. Like, I, at least I get to be impartial, I guess. Um, but, uh, like, the thing is, that I'm pretty sure even if they sent me one and it was annoying to use, I would just say it's annoying to use. Because I can't keep my mouth shut. That's probably why they don't want to send me anything. Just like... <laughs> just like, he doesn't... He won't shut up about it. Anyway. Um, yeah, so if you'd like to support the channel, Patreon, Teespring, links in the description. And that's it for the video, so thank you for watching, and goodbye.